All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Sunday morning Science of Mind class with your host, Dr. Petra. If you're watching us live on Facebook right now and you want to hop over to the Zoom interactive room, go ahead and click the link in the description above. And as always, I want to encourage everybody watching to visit CSLDallas.org for all the latest updates on events, workshops, courses, and to get spiritually fed by content such as this. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Petra Weldis. Thanks, Ryan, and good morning. Good morning to the Science of Mind class this morning um, on this fabulous spring day. And um, yeah, a huge thank you to everybody who sent me so much love from last Sunday. Super, super grateful, super appreciate it. Um, and also really appreciate Ryan for being a rock for me um, and each and every one of you. So uh, yeah, it's a journey, right? Life is a journey. Wait, so wait. Wait, Petra, I want to say to you guys out there, I was this close to busting out a Rod Stewart solo for you guys. You didn't even know I was about to take it over. So go ahead, Dr. Petra. <laughs> well, we might have to arrange for that. <laughs> That'd be pretty funny. All right, so um, yeah, Principles of Successful Living. That's our chapter that we've been in now for quite a while, Principles of Successful Living. And you know, one of the reasons why we're in spiritual community, one of the reasons why we spend every Sunday spending some time with the teachings of the science of mind and try to think about how do we apply it in our lives is because the uh, metaphysics and new thought and uh, spiritual living yeah, it's not a quick fix, right? Sure, we can manifest something instantaneously. We can use the law of attraction. We can use our spiritual tools. And um, we can, in fact, manifest something. Um, and we can, with our power of our positive thinking and our attitude, we can make a difference in our lives. But to actually create a different life altogether, a whole and sane and happy life, a life that has enough resiliency in it that we can deal with the issues and challenges that inevitably come up, a life that is enough strength to move uh, the project of our life forward, whether it's our own individual um, inspiration or whether it's participating and changing the world, right? That takes time. It takes time. The rearranging not only of our old thought patterns into spiritual patterns that are in alignment with the truth, but the actual becoming skilled in understanding metaphysics and using the tools, these things take time, which is why we are in spiritual community together. We go over and over and over and over the material so that each time we embody it a little more deeply um, each time we take up something that maybe we hadn't taken up before or we engage in a way of being in the world or practicing that we've heard about but maybe haven't fully dove into. And so principles of successful living is not like a, you know, it's not like a, I'm going to get a weekend, I'm going to go to a weekend retreat and I'm going to be blown out of my, you know, limitations and everything will be different. And I don't know about you, but I've had a lifetime of those. And um, they, you know, it's like New Year's resolution lasts about three weeks. And then there I am again. And, um, and so it is the slow and steady process of over and over and over and over again, applying the principles. And so, yeah, your support last week meant a lot to me um, because just like everybody else, we're all practicing. I'm practicing too. So this last bit of Principles of Successful Living is entitled Success and Happiness. And um, yeah, believe it or not, that in New Thought and Science of Mind, we actually believe that our lives should be successful and happy. Not like we're not going to have challenges and obstacles and problems along the way, because that's a part of growing. And it doesn't mean that we're doing anything wrong. It could be that we're learning things. Right? How many times did we fall off our bike when we first started learning how to um, 
ride our bike. How many times when we started a, um, some, to learn some new way of, um, I don't know, just think of a new program or trying to do a piece of art or, or simply um, learning how to do a run so that maybe we can run a, a half marathon. We make mistakes along the way, we hit plateaus along the way, we hit obstacles or just, um, or not so much that it's an obstacle, but also opportunities for coaching. Like, well, if I just did it this way, maybe that would get me over the next hump, get me through the next plateau, get me to the next level. Um, and all of that is a part of having a successful and happy life which means that we do actually have the tools and the resiliency and the spiritual grounding and the emotion, emotional depth to move with our lives and to stay committed to a full, rich, um, fulfilling life that actually contributes. Success and happiness are ours when we deal with absoluteness. This is the attitude we should have. <laughs> we should absolutely believe that success and happiness is ours by divine birthright. We are not here to suffer. We're not here to learn lessons, although we will learn lessons along the way, right? Just as we are here to learn how to do math and we learn, we learn how to read and we learn how to <coughs> communicate and we learn how to do all these things. And, and we have lessons along the way um, as we are growing and becoming. Now, I love what this next sentence here is. This does not mean that we need not be active. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, we shall be active. Oh, I still have my, I still have my mask on. Let me take that off. There we go. My, this is my new accoutrement. <laughs> we shall be active, but we need not compel things to happen. I love it when the Science of Mind class sets up the Sunday gathering, the Sunday celebration talk. So you're definitely going to want to tune into that as well. This does not mean that we need not be active, of course. Of course we shall be active, but we need not compel things to happen. Only remember we are surrounded by universal subjectivity, a creative consciousness, and a universal law, right? And so we use this law. It's receptive, it's neutral and personal, always receiving the impress of our thought and has no alternative but to manifest, Right. And so part of our success and happiness is that the more that we practice using the law, the more confidence we have in our ability to co-create. And so the more the bigger things we're willing to tackle in our own lives. The universal law doesn't know big or little. The universal law, like in the electricity doesn't know when whether it's whether it's lighting up a skyscraper or lighting up a single incandescent bulb. It, it doesn't know that and it makes no difference. Right, electricity is going to work, and um, and it's the same thing with these universal laws. Doesn't it, the law doesn't care what how big or little, but we begin to show ourselves that yes, in fact, this is this is something that's going on, and that we can use one use it. So here is uh, um, so here's a really interesting thought. Each one should realize that there is nothing in us which denies that which we desire. We should realize that, that there is nothing within us that denies that which we desire. Again, remember, we're not talking about the desire for stuff and, oh, if I have that sexy new car, I'll be happy. It's not the desires of our appetites. It's the desires of our deepest essential self, the desire for a meaningful life, the desire to contribute, the desire to belong, the desire to love, the desire to express our joy and creativity, right? These are the deepest desires that we have. And there's nothing in us which denies this. There's nothing within us which denies this, which means that there's nothing in life which denies this, because what's within us is life. The essential truth of who we are is the impulse of life seeking to express itself. Our unity with good is not established while there is anything in us which denies it, which seems to contradict the previous statement, except that what denies it is simply our false belief 
our false thought, the veils of separation that have that stand between us and our ability to believe that the universe is on our side, that the law is always operating for it in our favor. All right, the only thing that denies that is our own false thought is our own expectation it's not going to work out, our fear that something terrible is going to happen, our belief that the other shoe is going to drop, our um, sense that, um, yeah, you know, it never quite works out for me, or whatever those kinds of ideas are that stand in the way, um, or, you know, if it's always, there's always been somebody holding me back, right? And all of those things, all of those beliefs our beliefs about the condition, their beliefs about the human experience. Do you see none of them are in alignment with spiritual truth, with life, which is for life, which is for growth and evolution and expression. So while there's nothing inherent within us that denies our good, there's nothing in the essential truth of our nature that denies our good. There may be, in fact, things within our own thought processes wired into our subjective mind, wired into the way our brains have gotten used to thinking about the world that does in fact stand in the way, that does deny it. And so, so here's an interesting um, way to examine whether we are standing in that human limitation or whether we're standing in this essential truth that denies us nothing of our good. And that is when we notice that we ask ourselves, well, how shall I know when I know? How shall I know when I know what to do? How shall I know when I know how to use the law? How shall I know when I know that spirit is supporting me? How shall I know when it's safe to jump towards something exciting or how shall I know when it's um, necessary for me to say no to something? How shall I know? And I would just invite you to reflect on how often have we said that to ourselves? And another way that I notice that this shows up is this idea that there are parts of us. Well, a part of me knows the spiritual truth, but a part of me is like, oh my God, is this ever going to get better? A part of me knows the spiritual truth, but a part of me is so anxious. A part of me knows the spiritual truth, but a part of me is like, I don't know how it's going to happen. You see, and what we're doing there is we're basically flipping back and forth from our spiritual identity and our human identity or our spiritual understanding and our and and and. Uh, and allowing our the construct of our human um, decisions about life, or the way our human, uh, what should we say, like the perception of life, to be the place where we are creating our life from. The very fact that one can ask this question. How, how shall I know when I know? The very fact that one can ask this, ask this proves that we do not know. For when we know that we know, we prove our knowing by doing. See, this is what's really important because we, don't, we understand this idea that we need to be active. We need to be engaged. But we're engaged without fear or anxiety. We're engaged in the activities of our life with confidence because we know that we're using spiritual principles. We know that we're co-creating life. We know that the universe is on our side. We know that there's nothing in the universe holding this obstacle in place. There's nothing in, 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 in spiritual reality. God certainly isn't trying to teach us a lesson. Spirit isn't trying to teach us a lesson. We, it, the more that we know that, the more we can find a place to stand confidently to move forward. And we move forward by doing based on what we spiritually know, 
not what we humanly know. Oh, I know this pill is going to make it better. Oh, I know that this, that I'm going to be able to manage this. And if this happens and this happens and this happens, and I figure all this out, then, then it's, then it's all going to be okay. That, right. That's knowing based on the conditions of our life and figuring out, figuring out how to manipulate them and manage them and work with them. And if only this would happen and that would happen and that person would behave that way. And if they would just stop doing that and if those people would just stop and if they would just get, do you see all of that? I'm waiting for something to come into alignment. So then I can act. When I know that I know, then my action, I'm willing to act even though my human brain doesn't know how it's going to all work out. We prove our knowing by doing. Do you see? So, so, and, and it also means that we're not just sitting in our corner or somehow on our cushion doing our spiritual mind treatment and then saying, okay, lay it on me, God. All right, spirit, bring it to me. No, we actually have to go out and meet it. We have to get up off our cushion, get out of our beautiful spiritual um, um, bubble, if you so will, and get out in the world. And, and maybe we take our bubble with us instead of protecting ourselves in our spiritual bubble and being afraid to go out in the world or thinking that some, somehow magically it's going to happen. No, we take our confidence, our spiritual bubble, our conviction that it is unfolding. We take that into every step of the way and we become part of the answer. We are moved as part of the answer. We prove our knowing by doing. The thought sets definite forces in motion mind relative to the individual who thinks, right? So I think, you think, we think into our own lives and then thought sets these things in motion. Okay, so this is the last paragraph. A good demonstration is made when truth gathering its own power lifts one out of one's own environment. And until then, until that time comes, we should stay where we are in order that we may know when a demonstration has been made. What does this mean? This means that we move in alignment with as we are confident to move, as we are we, we have that sense of knowing, oh, this, I'm going to do this. I need to show up there. I need to make that phone call. I need to keep moving in that direction. Because otherwise, what we do is we tend to start running around like a chicken with our head cut off. Well, I better figure this out. I better figure this out. So I got to do that and I got to do that. And, you know, and that's when we do what's called the uh, geographical solution. We think that we're just going to pick up and move and somehow it's going to be different someplace else. The problem is, of course, we take ourselves with us. Or we quit a job or we get rid of a relationship. And then, you know, two years later, we realize we're in, we're in the same job with the same boss with a different face. Or we're in another relationship that's exactly the same, only with a different face, right? Do you see we've, 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 what do we want to say? We've moved to thinking the move would make it different rather than doing our work in consciousness and then allowing the movement to be part of us demonstrating. And when we do that, right, the, the, the moving becomes much more effortless, much more obvious, much more a part of, oh, of course, this is what needs to happen. This is what I need to do. As opposed to, do you see, well, I better do this. Well, I just can't do it anymore. I'm going to just get out of here which is a reactionary stance as opposed to feeling that impress from the knowing that we know. It is not a good demonstration if when we give our treatments, we have to struggle just as before. We haven't actually demonstrated. If we're struggling just as before, we haven't actually demonstrated. We're still locked into the part of us that thinks it has to figure it out. We're still locked in the part of us that says the part of me, well, I don't know if it's really going to work out. Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. You know, that whole thing where we pretend we don't know. Lots of times I, people ask for treatment for clarity and 
is they don't need clarity. They just don't want to admit to themselves what they already know, right? Or they're not willing to do the work to actually look, to ask the question, to take the time to contemplate what is here that is seeking to reveal itself. Uh, a demonstration, it is not a good demonstration if when, we, if when we give our treatments, we have to struggle just as before. Do you see? If we are doing our spiritual treatment and we know that we know, not so much every step of the way, but we know that we know that we're using the universal law, that we're co-creating with the creative process, that we know how it works and what we are doing. Now the activity we do without struggle. I don't know how else to say that, right? It's not always using grace. It's not always that, but it's without struggle. We, we, we feel the, oh, do that. And it works out great. And we feel the, oh, do that. And it doesn't work out. Okay. Let's try something new. It, when, if it doesn't work out, it's not this crushing blow. It's not this disaster. It doesn't, it doesn't cause us to fall into despair. And it sure as heck doesn't cause us to, to um, ask, is it working? Do I know? Is spirit really on my side? Is the law supporting me? We don't have to ask any of those questions. We just realize, oh, well, that wasn't the answer to the, that wasn't the answer. That wasn't the way to the demonstration. That didn't work out. And so there's that, um, yeah, I don't know. What is that? Confidence. I guess it's a certain kind of ease. It's an, an assurance that that we just keep moving, but there's no struggle in it, right? And so, you know, this is what the word faith means. Faith isn't the faith in a belief system. It's not the faith in, you know, God is going to somehow magically fix it. Faith means I trust that I know how this works. I trust that I am actively engaged in that. And so I trust that when I put my foot out and I start walking toward it, things are going to unfold. I don't have to know every step of the way. I don't have to be anxious and I sure as heck don't have to struggle. This is, this creates a happy and successful life. Do you see? Not just instant manifestations along the way, but it creates a, a, a consciousness, an atmosphere in which we, and from which we engage in our lives. Yeah. All right. So, um, and then, of course, a definite and concrete acceptance of our desire, right, as we do that with our spiritual work, that must manifest, even though every thought on earth has to change to compel it. See, that's what we have to know. I, I usually say in my treatments when I feel like it's like very different. The treatment that I'm treating for is very different. The outcome I'm treating for is very different than what the current experience is. Right, I remind myself the law, if the law has to rearrange the very molecules and atoms of the universe itself, it does that. It knows how to do that. Even if every thought on earth had to change to compel it. And that's like that. What an amazing thing. Do you see that completely takes the struggle out? So it's not that I know how it's going to happen. It's not that I even necessarily know what the form is going to look like. It's not that I know that I'm doing the right thing. That's not what we're knowing. That is not what we're knowing. I'd like to say that again. How do I know that this thing that I want, this desire is the right thing? <laughs> Try it out and find out. That's not what we're knowing. What we're knowing is that we are using spiritual principles we are participating in the co-creative process and we expect it to work. That's what we know. And how do I know that I know that? I prove it by living based on that. And I begin to see not only the demonstration in consciousness, but the manifestation outpictured in my life.
All right, lots of juicy stuff here. So we're going to stop here um, as we finish out this particular chapter um, on this idea of building a whole life that is generally successful and happy despite the, you know, despite the bumps in the road. Um, and so we're going to stop here, see what questions, comments, thoughts, stories, sharings you have. We'd love to hear from you. Um, so I'm going to turn to Ryan and um, check in, Ryan, see what's going on. Thanks, Petra. And once again, welcome to everybody who's joining us on Facebook Live and on Zoom. We appreciate you guys participating. And so I'd love to just ask anybody if they'd like to engage, here's a couple ways on how you can do that. Um, if you're in the Facebook Live, please go ahead and put your questions or comments within the comments field of our live stream. And if you're over here in the Zoom room, hit the raise your hand icon located down below, or you can always put your questions and comments here inside of the chats and we'll bring them into the room. I do want to let everybody know I keep things anonymous. So that way, if you want to ask something a little bit deeper, go ahead and feel free to do that inside of the comment field and I can read it out loud. So now is the time to engage. We are an interactive experience, not a Ryan and Peter hour. So feel free to hit the raise your hand icon. Yes, please and, do. And well, uh, folks are finding their way to do that. Um, I did see one of the questions that came up on Facebook and it was asking, so with this being said, uh, I'm gonna kind of summarize it. You have conviction and you have faith right? Uh -huh. Where do these two things fall into the demonstration process? Yeah, that's a great question, right? So the conviction is the, um, the conviction is in the use of the creative process. Right? The conviction is in our understanding of the nature of reality and the use of the creative pro process that we are that we recognize that this is how the universe works. And we build conviction by demonstrating, right? Which is why often you start with little things and you start uh, manifesting things things like literally things like parking places and cars and homes and right because you can point to it or money because you can point to it and you say look I manifested that it's easier to fool ourselves right if we're doing our spiritual work around deeper joy or a better relationship or showing up as a more loving person right it's easy to fool ourselves um, and and so we start out by demonstrating things because as I said, you can concretely point to it. You've either demonstrated it or you, you haven't. That allows us to build conviction. To pra By practicing, we get to see that we can now go on to more, um, well, I don't want to say difficult things, but more um, uh, intangible things, more things that are more about how we live our life, how we engage with challenges, how we um, want to um, release trauma or show up as a spiritually grounded person in difficult situations, right? And so, but because we've proven it to ourselves with stuff, we can, we can now have the conviction that the same thing is true when I'm dealing with a different kind of less tangible situation. So that's where conviction comes in. We actually want to, to show ourselves that, that it actually works. Um, and so when we do our spiritual, spiritual mind treatment or our spiritual um, work, we're building on that conviction. Faith, on the other hand, then, is our willingness to be so convinced that the spiritual work works that we're willing to go out in the world and act upon that conviction. We're, we have the faith that if we move in that direction in some form or fashion in our lives, that the universe is rallying around to support the, the outcome. 
that the door will open when we need it, or if it if it, if it appears as though a door is closing, that we just start looking around for the window. Okay, well that wasn't it, right? And as we and so it's the faith of being able to step off the edge, and recognizing that you know there's that great state. A great uh, statement. I have no idea where it comes from. That says, uh, "Step off the edge, and you will either find solid ground to stand on, or you will find your wings to fly." Faith, the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things unseen. The evidence of things hoped for. I have the conviction to do my spiritual work. So I now see the evidence as I move in my life. The substance of things unseen. That work that I've done in the unseen realm of spirituality, of causal reality, begins to take substance and form before my very eyes. But I actually have to move out into it. Otherwise, I don't see it truthfully. And I can't tell you how many times I've worked with people who have realized that in looking back over, so they come, there's a, a desire for a demonstration or something to be worked with or whatever. And, um, and, they, and they look in the more recent past and if we're uh, willing to be self-aware, right? Then there's the ability to point to, oh, wow, look, there was a door that opened and I didn't step through it. There was an opportunity and I didn't take it. There was an awareness and I denied it. I shoved it aside. I pretended not to see it. There was a red flag and I ignored it. Right? Do you see that, that that's part of the faith is to actually trust those things, to trust them and then to move through the open door or to stop at the red flag and to, to make a different decision. Right. Faith. So that's the thing. Faith isn't, oh, I have faith in something that's going to somehow, I don't know. Faith is a verb as far as I'm concerned. Faith is a way of living in the world. It, faith lives out our conviction of our understanding of spiritual principles and how it works in the creative process. And so we build the conviction and they kind of go together, right? We start with a little thing and then we act on faith and then it happens. And we're like, wow, my God, look at that. So we have a little more conviction. And then we act on faith and we're like, wow, look at that. So we have a lot more conviction. Do you see that the two things are then mutually um, supporting each other? And um yeah, and that's how we grow our conviction while growing our faith. Great, that's a great question. Thanks, Ryan. So let's see if anybody's raised their hand or if there is another comment or question. Yeah, I would uh, really encourage all of you to participate in whatever way you feel good to. Uh, if you wanna hit the raise your hand icon, I see a few folks doing that. If you wanna put your chats in the comments, I see some folks doing that. Um, so we're going to call in uh, the first person and then we'll, uh, we have a couple folks to go through Petra. So okay, great. R Rhonda, we're going to call you in first. Rhonda, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Hi, Rhonda. Good morning. Good morning. I just uh, wanted to say I love this, uh, this chapter and this topic and how, um, for me, that's the way it's been a wonderful experience when I see these uh, things show up and um, and kind of how you're explaining. It's like um, just to know, like, it's just, it's not like the pushing or forcing or trying to figure it out anymore. It's just all of a sudden, oh, this thought pops in. I should do this. I should yes. do that. And then um, I follow it. And it's just, you know, amazing how things just you know, opportunities show up that, that I couldn't even have imagined. And uh, I do feel like today, like the co-creating is, uh, you know, fully active and it's just so exciting. And um, there's just this real, um, I don't, I can't explain it, but it's just such a good feeling. And uh, sometimes, you know, the patience had to be there and I had to just trust and, and uh, wait because it, yes, you know, yes. I, <laughs> And that um, there was points, you know, where, uh, you know, that fear can show up, but 
but what's great is through the, through the teachings, it's like I've learned to oh, just uh, turn away from that mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and focus on what I want, and um, and it works. So um, my, I, yeah. So I just wanted to share that I had a yes. you know, job op job opportunity that was then um, showed up, and it was just like little thoughts, like you know, I've always done this, I've always been good at this, and then just through that little thought, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you just know which path to kind of, you know, follow. And it's, it's just, um, anyway, it's been a great experience. So thank Beautiful. You. Rhonda, thank you so much for sharing that. That was, that was a perfect explanation of how that works. And, and I love that you share it. And I love that also, you know, that moment of patience, right? We, we want our instant demonstration, our instant gratification. And, and if the molecules of the universe have to be rearranged, you know, sometimes that does actually take a little bit of time in the space-time continuum. It doesn't take any time in the universal sense of the absolute, but it does sometimes take time in the space-time continuum. And that's a part of our faith too, is to just keep moving with it. Um, and I love that you said um, that you didn't have to figure everything out, but you could, you knew, oh, let's follow that path. Oh, I, oh, but, but you, because you always were staying fixed on your end result. So, and I could hear it in your voice, a successful and happy life. I could hear it in your voice that, and that's what the majority of our life should in fact feel like. Now, this again, doesn't mean we're not gonna have obstacles. It doesn't mean people aren't gonna die and we won't have grief or whatever it is, but our, the, the, the sense of our life is successful and happy, meaning that we can in fact move through the, the challenges and we can really enjoy um, the process of co-creation. Thanks, Rhonda. I'm so glad. All right, Ryan. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Rhonda. We appreciate that. And I know I've seen that kind of thing happen in my life as well, too. Awesome. So I'm going to call into the room Sandra. Sandra, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Hi, Sandra. Sandra going once. Sandra going twice. <laughs> All right, so as Sandra figures that part out, we'll go ahead and bring her back to uh, the room here in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I did see one of the questions that was coming through, it had to do with mental equivalence. Mm -hmm. And so with this chapter being in mind, success and happiness. Well, if you grew up in a despaired household where, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the story is, and you never had the opportunity to be around what would be, you know, defined by society as success. Um, how would you how would you start to create the vision for it? How would you actually get to that point? How would you develop your mental equivalent for it? Well, Ryan, you're asking a great question. And of course, you're setting us up for the next chapter. The whole next chapter is on mental equivalence. And it's, it's a fabulous chapter. Oh, my God. Because we're going to actually use this as one of the ways in which we create conviction, right, is to build that idea. And yeah, it, that, it's really a great question because so much of what we see or experience in life is either the dysfunction of our families or media-induced ideas of what success and happiness looks like. I'll never forget reading an article a, a few years back. I don't remember what it was. And they were talking about friends and cheers and I, I don't know, a whole bunch of different, I'm Seinfeld and a whole bunch of different um, shows that were really popular. And, and the question was, don't any of these people work? Don't they work? How do they all have these fabulous apartments and nobody ever goes to work? And, and the problem, of course, with that is we have these people in these shows in our living room, just like we have our friends and our neighbors and our family in our living room. And we think somehow that that's reality or the uh, advertising that says, well, you'll be successful if you wear these clothes or your hair is all bright and shiny or you buy this car or what, this is, a, this is the way you show that you're successful or whatever. 
Um, and then we have the pressures of our family. Um, you're successful. You know, in my family, I was only successful if I got straight A's. And um, I was only successful if I was going to um, have a business and make a lot of money. Um, and, and so the, really understanding what success and happiness means for us as individuals is a profound spiritual activity. And, and, it, and it's okay, right? It's okay to manifest the house and the car and the promotion and the whatever and the, and the career and the job. And it's okay to manifest all of that and to discover these things are important to me. These things aren't important to me, right? So, so, I'll, I'll, so when I uh, first got into Science of Mind many, many years ago, the measure of your prosperity, prosperity consciousness was whether or not you could demonstrate a uh, red um, Mercedes Benz two seater, whatever the coupe is, sports car. That was the measure of your prosperity consciousness. And everybody was talking about, talk, running around, talking about how they were going to manifest this car because, by God, they had an opulent prosperity consciousness. Well, I remember looking at that car, and at that point, that car was forty-five thousand dollars or sixty thousand dollars or whatever it was. And I thought to myself, I can buy a cabin in the woods for that amount of money. I have no interest in that car. I'm going to buy a cabin in the woods, which I did. And now we've bought a second one. The first one I sold years ago. I, I had no interest in that car. I, I wanted a cabin in the woods. That, to me, was my prosperity demonstration. A place where I could go to and hike and be in retreat and listen to the sound of the water and the wind in the pines and watch the animals and the birds and just walk out my front door and go hiking. That was my idea of success. I had people criticize my prosperity consciousness. I had people say that I, I just didn't have a big enough dream. I had people, yeah, diss me quite a bit. It was pretty interesting. But I, just, I had to find that place within myself. It says, well, what is it for me? And as I said, I had one, I ended up selling it so that I could raise my son. And, and Karen and I have uh, a couple of years ago, um, we bought ourselves a cabin in the woods because I, I, that for me is part of the kind of life I want to have. Do you see that? That's an important thing. Now, on the other hand, I've always said money isn't important. What's important is that I be of service, that I do my ministry. So money isn't really important. So it took me a long time. I mean, and I had a child to raise. So I was utterly certain that my ministry had to support me to raise a son. I had to make enough money to raise a son, but I never really went beyond that. It was, I need enough money to have a, you know, to raise my son. And that meant, you know, have a home and things like that. So I manifested that, but not a whole lot more. Until at one point, my son was, I don't know, he was 10, we, uh, whatever, yeah, something like that. And uh, we sold the house to buy another house because we were needing a little more space um, and we wanted to upgrade just a little bit. And we, I had made the decision, this is kind of the happiness part. I had made the decision that I was gonna be the cool house. I wanted Jason to bring his friends to our house because I didn't do that when I was growing up. My dad was a rageaholic. I never brought anybody over. Um, but I wanted to be the cool house. I wanted for people to, I wanted for him to have his friends, especially as he got into the teenage years, because I wanted to know where he was, what he was doing, and who he was doing it with. It's all very, I, I, had, a, I had a clear agenda. So we bought this beautiful house. It had this backyard that was kind of boring just flat and with grass and and um and so my partner and I at the time we began to talk about what if we built a pool back there now I have to tell you that I have never imagined that I could own a house with a pool because I, I money isn't important to me status symbols aren't important to me it's important to me for me to be of service and give my gift and so I was like oh man a pool Wow. And I thought, oh, I don't know. Can we actually do that? Can I, can I, can I imagine doing that? And I had to confront all the snobby thoughts I had about people who had pools and had spent all their money on big houses and pools. And I was doing good work in the world. Oh God, it was terrible. I had to really confront all my prejudices and all my 
stuff around all that. And, you know, still believing that to be spiritual, you have to be poor and all I had to confront all that over and over and over and over again, I had to confront all of that. And um, in the meantime, we went looking for a house, we, not only had we found this house, but then we, we were like, uh, okay, so we we learned that we could roll a pool into the mortgage, that they would appraise the house as if it were had a pool. And then they would give us that money to construct the pool. And then, you know, it would all somehow work out in the end. And so we, we, we built this amazing saltwater pool in the back of the house and a beautiful, you know, a surrounded by a deck and beautiful uh, gardens and a little rockery. We decided not to go over the fountain. And, and I, I, it was, it was, it was amazing it was amazing and jason spent the next six years with his friends in our backyard and we were the cool house we had sometimes we had anywhere from three to ten kids at dinner at least three times a week and i learned to be utterly prepared for however many kids were going to be there that we were going to be feeding for dinner because we actually sat down at dinner we had knives and forks we had cloth napkins and we had conversation around the dinner table and those kids wanted to be at our house. They wanted to be at our house. So I got that pool so that, so that I could have a happy family, so that I could have that experience. Do you see? That's the work we have to do. We have to get underneath all the messages. We have to get underneath all the false thoughts that we have ourselves. We, and to really build that mental equivalent. What is the life I'm trying to build? What is the life I want to have? What is the life that feels like it expresses me and contributes? So I wanted to contribute to my son's life and the life of his friends. Yeah, I became the mom that everybody came to talk to and about their relationship issues and whether or not they should go to go on the pill and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and all that all that stuff, right? Because we were the safe house. And that was really, really important to me. So I put a pool in the ground, something that I had had opinions about in the past. I put a pool in the ground in service to a happy life. These are the things that we create as mental equivalents. And so we're going to move into that chapter. Um, it's chapter 17. It is a brilliant chapter doing this exact work, finding out how we think about these things and what it is that we're creating um, and, and becoming more and more self-aware of that, uh, that we want to create. What does it mean, our deepest desire? And how do we create that full idea about it, image, feeling, sense? We'll talk about all of that. All right, so we have sort of set ourselves up beautifully for the talk uh, today at uh, 1030. We'll be at our celebration. Remember, we'll be open for Easter. Come on campus for Easter. And if you are unable to come on campus or you're out of town um, somewhere, please do join us online. Everything will be live streamed. It'll be fabulous. We have Cornell on the flute and we have all kinds of other special, ooh, special, special things for Easter. Um, so you aren't going to want to miss it. Um, so that's the other thing I will say is that next week our Sunday service, our Sunday class will be short because there's a lot of technical stuff that we have to do and Ryan carries a big piece of that. Um, and so, um, yeah, next Sunday, our, our um, Sunday morning class will probably only be 30 minutes. Um, nine. Actually, sorry to cut in on that, Peter. We're not going to have our oh. Sunday morning Science of Mind class via Zoom because of all of the Easter celebration that is going on. So just heads up, but we are going to play one of the greatest hits. So if you're not available to come and join us live for the Easter celebration, um, join us online for the Sunday morning Science of Mind class. And we're going to bring out one of your uh, favorite ones. And so I just encourage everybody to participate in that. Yeah. Hang out on Facebook. Thank you, Ryan. I knew there was a change. I knew there was something we were doing that was different. We are also considering shifting the science mind class 15 minutes earlier from nine to nine 45. Once we're back into the 
Um, once we're back into the sanctuary in April, we've got a lot of technical things that we're kind of figuring out. Ryan has to do this and then he has to do that. And there's just, we just have to figure out the timing. So we'll be letting you know as these things unfold um, and um, keep you posted. We're kind of feeling our way into it as we begin coming back on campus for which we're all very, very, very excited. We love you. We'll see you at the celebration on Sunday. We'll see you. Um, as soon as we see you, uh, wherever we see you, have a beautiful day. Bye for now.